that changing the way we drive can improve transportation efficiencies. But what if we change the way we build and live in our cities? That's the subject of our next story, Searching for Utopia. We'll travel to the United Arab Emirates and discover a city rising out of the desert. Let's take a look. From the beginning, we've dreamed of Utopia. A place where we could live in harmony with each other and in balance with nature. Many have imagined it, tried to design it, but the dream always slipped away. Then I heard they were building a new city called Mazdar, near Abu Dhabi, in the Arabian desert. It sounded like an unlikely place for Utopia, and I wanted to see it. The last half century has been a pretty bad time for the making of cities, mostly. The natural tendency has been to accommodate to the automobile more than anything else. Try walking around Abu Dhabi. It's impossible. You have to take a car everywhere. Dubai, the same thing. They are among the least pedestrian-friendly places in the world. They are not green by any other measure either. And these are not easy things to fix. Mazdar is still under construction, and it doesn't look like much from the highway but they claim it's going to redefine the way cities are designed, built, and powered. Mazdar City in Abu Dhabi will be the city of the future and the role model for the world. Once you see what they've envisioned for this utopian city, it's very impressive. It's carbon neutral, pedestrian friendly, and powered by renewable energies. But I do notice we're going to have to change our relationship with cars. Welcome to Mustard City. We are driving in the in the bowels of Mazdar City in an electric transportation system. It's slightly unnerving to sit in this for the first time. And where are we going? The first big move the architects at Foster and Partners made was to put all transportation underneath the city leaving the streets of Mazdar totally free of cars. The place reminded me of a medieval city, and actually, many design elements are adapted from ancient Arabic towns and villages. It's all about looking back into history to move forward. There's some very, very simple ideas that have a huge impact. This is a pedestrian zone, there's no cars here. This, en this has enabled us to push our streets together to take the advantage of the shade, channel the cooling breezes through. The whole scale here is based on the human being. It's not based on the motor car. As soon as you lift up the pedestrian plane by seven meters, you've suddenly captured this breeze. What you can see here in the balconies, we've got uh, a modern interpretation of an ancient Arabic screen. What we must avoid is direct sunlight hitting any piece of glass. As soon as the sun hits the glass, the heat's transferred into the building and we have to use more energy to cool it down. Can this really make all that much of a difference? Yeah, absolutely. For example, downtown Abu Dhabi, 60 meter wide streets, black asphalt, mirrored, reflective buildings, and no relief from the sun. On a day in September, the air temperature in both places was 39 degrees. In Abu Dhabi, the temperature measured at the asphalt was 57 degrees. In Mazdar, the temperature measured on the ground 33 degrees. So we've actually lowered the air temperature. We're trying to do as much as possible with as little as possible. These simple design moves cut air conditioning needs by 60%. But this place is also technically very sophisticated. The roof panels not only provide shade, they also generate electricity. 
and the walls themselves are made of glass-reinforced concrete, literally sand taken from the desert. Everything here is geared towards maximizing energy efficiency. MASDAR does represent a whole different value system. It represents an acknowledgement that eventually everybody has to go in a different kind of direction, no matter how much money they have, no matter how much oil they have, no matter anything else. All of the cities here in this part of the world have come out of nowhere. There was nothing here not so long ago, except small settlements in the desert. And then all of this oil and all of this money, and suddenly, you know, wham, these cities started popping up. But they sprung up in a false love of a Western model that was already out of date. The model of the late 20th century automobile-based energy-hogging city. For most of the world, energy is very expensive. But the United Arab Emirates is sitting on 10% of the world's oil. And energy is cheap. So cheap, you can run a ski slope in a shopping mall and build the world's tallest skyscraper. But even here, cheap energy won't last forever, and the people behind Mazdar are determined to find alternatives. One of the most crucial aspects of our energy modeling and scenario quantification is how much energy in total is the world going to use in 2050? The Scenarios team is a bunch of people with rich imagination, I would say. We have political scientists, economists, geopolitical experts. Really, we try to simplify the complexity all around us. We, in the Scenarios team, are currently putting a lot of attention into cities and city development. A lot of mega cities are going to be built in the coming decades. We're talking about the equivalent of a new city of a million people every week. That is an incredible demand. Most of the world's resources are consumed by the cities. What if we could offer a blueprint for a better city? Public transportation, information, energy. We understand demand will rise. We understand that current supplies will struggle to keep pace. So we have to, of course, find ways of bridging the gap between the demand and the supply. Decisions that we take now are going to have a major impact on decades to come. There's enough oil under these sands to last 150 years. But fundamental to the Mazdar ideal is getting energy from renewable sources, from geothermal and wind, and most of all, from a source they have in abundance in the desert, the sun. This field of solar panels makes more than enough electricity to run Mazdar and the excess power is sent to the Abu Dhabi grid. But silicon panels are expensive, and the price of solar power needs to drop if it's going to be competitive from Africa to Asia to Arizona. In the future, Mazdar hopes to get energy from this prototype called the solar beam down. Using highly reflective mirrors, the solar beam down may generate power more cheaply and ecologically than silicon panels. The mirrors bounce the sun's rays up to the tower and then down to a point. 
reaching a temperature of 600 degrees, steam can be generated to run turbines to make electricity. There's just one problem. Neither of these solar technologies work at night. So Mazdar needs to draw power from the grid when the sun goes down. And that power comes from natural gas. The reality is it's just not yet possible to power Mazdar entirely without fossil fuels. The great challenge with Mazdar will be how do you make it a place that will not be just this ideal city that no other place could actually aspire to because it doesn't seem real. What Mazdar has to be is a laboratory that develops things that then can be applied in existing cities all around the world because that's where it will pay off. There's no payoff if it's just about itself. The payoff is how can everything it's trying to do matter in the rest of the world? Right now, there's only a store, two restaurants, a bank, and a few hundred students living here. It's too early to tell if Mazdar will work as a city when it's finished. But much has been achieved. They are carbon neutral and largely powered by renewable energies. Solutions here won't work everywhere, though. Many cities are in cold climates, and cooling is not their energy problem. They need to let sunlight in, not keep it out. Cities like Los Angeles or Houston are built around cars. Can Mazdar's lessons be applied to them? Still, it's a step in the right direction, and it's impressive that this step is being taken by a country that doesn't need to take it. I met a guy who said, actually, they did need to take it. He took me to the desert to explain. God says, God talks about man's place in, in the universe, that this world is a trust. And uh, God offered this trust to the mountains, to the heavens, to, uh, uh, to, to the land, to earth. And all, and all refused it, refused to take this trust. But man being you know, adventurous, uh, a bit vain, maybe too ambitious, being man, accepted it. Now, accepting it, uh, there is a responsibility. Taking responsibility isn't always easy. Utopia may be unattainable, but we must reach for it. And Mazdar does give us a clue to what cities will be like in the future. They may not look quite like Mazdar, but they will be shaped by the same concerns, by energy, where it comes from, and how it's used. The way we've been building cities lately is unsustainable. We can't go on building them that way. But to say that we can't build cities the way we have been building them doesn't mean we can't build cities in the future. In fact, we have to build cities. Cities are the essential statement of human civilization. So we will continue to make them. But we have to make them in a different way. What we've seen is that the world of 2050 won't look drastically different from the world today. But the challenges of a growing population and increased energy use demand real solutions. It's innovations like those we've just seen that will be critical in charting our path to the world of 2050.
that world-class cities are understanding that they have to do whatever they can to improve the quality of life in their cities. And so what we're looking to do is to make New York City the greatest, greenest, big city in the world. A lot of the changes that you're seeing in New York City right now are a direct result of Mayor Bloomberg's Plan YC initiative, which is looking at all sorts of different ways and all sorts of city agencies to improve the way people live, work, and play. Our uh, agenda is to unclog our streets so that commerce doesn't get stifled. Our agenda is to clean the air and the water, use less energy. And we really try to focus on things that improve the quality of our lives today. New York's approach is really fantastic because what it does is take this culture that we've created that really focuses on automobiles and shifts it a little bit to looking at people and actually moving people rather than moving automobiles. And when you really start looking at streets in a kind of people-oriented way rather than a car-oriented way, it just starts to make sense. You start to realize the car, you know, in the most practical of terms, just doesn't make a lot of sense in a place like New York City. One of the really fantastic things that New York is doing is really ramping up its bicycle infrastructure. We just rolled out 200 miles of on-street bike lanes in the last three years. So we now have over 450 miles of on-street bike lanes, which is creating a real network. And now we really actually have a cycling infrastructure. You ride spots of New York City that you'd never ride before, you know, because you actually have a dedicated lane. Some of them are even like off traffic, so you're really protected. We're building more robust bike facilities like this one, um, like the protected lanes on 8th and 9th Avenue. We're putting in more bike parking all around the city. We have the Bikes and Buildings Bill now, which allows tenants to request access uh, from their landlords to commercial office buildings so that they can have safe, secure bike parking. This is really for everyone. It's not just for Spandex or the Brave. This is for, you know, mom, dad, kids, everyone. I trust. <laughs> that's, our, that's our bike coordinator. Bus rapid transit is very important to the future of New York City, and I look at it as really a surface subway system. We put a new select bus service in the Bronx called the BX12, which is the major east-west connector in the northern part of the city. And we put in transit signal priority technology so that when buses hit a green light, the transponder would read that it was a bus there and give the bus the green light and hold the green light longer. And then we put in off-board fare collection so that People could pay for their fare before they got on the bus. You know, that delay when people are sort of going through their pockets and looking for change and trying to get their fare cards out, it's about a third of the delay in bus travel. Bus ridership went up 30 percent, uh, bus speeds were improved by 20 percent, and in something that's really unheard of in my entire lifetime in New York City, some 98 percent of New Yorkers were very satisfied with the service. 356,000 pedestrians each and every day in Times Square. And so many of them were trading the safety of the sidewalk for dangerous streets because there just wasn't enough room. There was like a 10 to 1 ratio of pedestrians versus cars and yet 90% of the space was allocated to cars. They were very dysfunctional streets. They weren't really even working very well for motorists. We came up with a plan that while it was sort of counterintuitive to take Broadway out of the system and make the network work better, it actually worked better for traffic. It was a huge win for pedestrian space. We've created 1.8 acres of new pedestrian space there that's like one and a half uh, football fields. And it was a tremendous win for safety, some 63% uh, reduction in injuries in the quarter. And you go there now, and the first thing you notice is how quiet certain parts of Times Square are now. You can have a conversation and not have to shout above the din of traffic. And then businesses really loved it. As you can imagine, the more foot traffic, the better it is for business. And so the way we re-engineered our streets is not only to make them better from a safety perspective, better from a mobility perspective, but it's, it's better business. Well, since Plan uh, YC was released in 07, traffic fatalities are down 20%. That's good. New York City's life expectancy has gone up one year and seven months in the last eight years. And part of that is reduced traffic deaths, a variety of other things as well. It's taken them essentially three years to have a huge change in the way that their citizens commute, the way that the people that live there actually enjoy their outdoor space. That's a big deal. Three years in a planning time frame is a very short amount of time. We're in a global economy and people can choose to locate their businesses and locate themselves anywhere. So we want to improve quality of life. We want to make our cities livable so that people choose to stay here and invest their capital here. Once you realize that you can use your streets 
to improve the quality of life, the economics, and the environmental health of your city, I think that's a transformative moment. And so mayors around the world are, are looking at their streets differently. And you don't have to be a big city like New York to be able to make important changes that matter to millions of people each and every day.